Welcome to the Brain Bite series hosted by the University of Washington Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. For this episode, we interviewed UW ADRC researcher and clinical genetic counselor, Brad Rolfe, about his recent research with Dr. Suman Jayadev that was made possible by funding from the Ellison Foundation. My name is Brad Rolf. I'm a genetic counselor at the University of Washington in the Division of Medical Genetics, and I've been working at the ADRC for many years alongside Sumi Jayadev, who's a neurologist. Genetic counselors do a lot of different things. Uh, clinically, we tend to work with individuals and families who may be affected by genetic conditions. So we are part of the teams that help identify if there's a genetic cause for a condition in a family. And, and then once we've identified it, try and connect those individuals with resources to either um, help uh, you know, get connected with treatment plans or, or support groups if there aren't treatments available. Right now, the people who would benefit the most from a genetic evaluation for Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia are people who are experiencing cognitive symptoms themselves. So it could be anything from mild cognitive impairment up to, you know, more, uh, more advanced stages of cognitive impairment. And really what we would be looking for would be people who, in addition to having cognitive symptoms themselves, develop those symptoms at an early age, so well before age 65, or, or even in some cases really before age 60, and also have a family history with other people who have also had dementia or Alzheimer's disease in their family. And the reason for that is we know that the majority of cases of Alzheimer's disease and, and other forms of dementia too are usually not inherited. There's usually not one single genetic factor that's causing that condition in a family. But we know that in a very small proportion of cases, there is. And so those are the people that really benefit the most from genetic testing because we can identify what that single cause is in the family. And even if we don't have a treatment available to stop the progression of the disease or reverse it, we at least know the cause. And then other people in the family who are concerned about their chance of developing that in the future can decide whether or not they would like to undergo testing to find out if they've inherited this change that would then make it very likely that they would develop Alzheimer's or another form of dementia later in their life. We have the ability to do the genetic testing, but what we hadn't done as a field was really ask ourselves the question, you know, is this the right thing to do for our patients? We certainly get asked a lot. Patients are aware that there can be hereditary causes of Alzheimer's and dementia. And then there are also hereditary factors like the APOE gene that influence risk, but don't strictly cause Alzheimer's disease. And so what we really wanted to do was in a controlled way, offer genetic testing to a group of, of people who were willing to do that, who had an indication, right? So their age of onset was earlier than we would expect and they had a family history indicating that there was more likely, not certainly, but more likely to be uh, some underlying genetic cause that was contributing to that. And we wanted to see how, how it went, right? If we did this in a really structured, safe way, how, did, how would people experience that? And would there be any sort of negative things that emerged that we should be aware of as providers so that when other people come and ask for the service, we can give them that anticipatory guidance uh, saying, here are some things to think about based on experiences of other people who've gone through this process. And We had a great cohort of participants. They really opened themselves up to not only going through our protocol, but sharing their experience and sharing how they were reacting to the process throughout. So from the very early stages where we were just talking about doing a genetic test and exploring the possibility that maybe this was a hereditary condition in their family, and then getting to that point where we did in fact deliver test results and follow up with them after the fact to see how those test results really impacted them one month out and then six months out. So we, we had some nice uh, long-term data to, to really draw our conclusions from based on the willingness of our participants to share their, their reactions and their experiences. Anytime you're working with someone whose memory isn't, you know, functioning quite at the level that it used to, 
you know, you, you run the risk that you communicate something that just doesn't stick, uh, that's important, important for them to remember. Why did we do the testing? What, what are the possible results that we're going to get? And so we designed the study quite deliberately to have participants and a co-participant. Our big challenge was trying to assess where people were at during, in, in the moment, right? So during these visits, and it was something that, you know, we did our best to gauge with open-ended questions and getting people to tell us what they understood from what we had just communicated to them. And then we followed up with that after the, the visit with some surveys. And that's when we found that people really did remember the results that we gave them and they remembered um, the significance of those results. So whether or not they were positive or negative or uncertain. And, and that was really helpful for us to know because I think that's a big open question that a lot of people who are working with patients that have dementing illnesses wonder about, you know, how likely is it that people are going to, you know, hear this information, but then not, not internalize it, not remember it, and then not be able to benefit from it. So what are we talking about when we're doing a genetic test called exome sequencing? We're actually looking at the parts of a person's genetic information uh, that are called genes, right? So we're looking at a person's genes, which in most cases are used by the body to make some sort of product that's necessary for our bodies to do all the things that they have to do, right? So our genes tell our bodies how to grow, how to develop. And then once we are, you know, grown and developed, you know, running all of those processes that keep us going, you know, day after day. And so when we do a genetic test that looks at those genes, we're actually reading through them in the same way that you would read through words in a book. And what we're looking for are changes in that sequence that may or may not be significant. So we start by just looking to see, are there any changes? And then the changes that we identify, we then have to do a second step where we try to figure out, is this a change that damages that gene and causes it not to function correctly? Or is this a harmless change that has no impact on the gene? We spent a lot of time talking about the best approach to genetic testing. So exome sequencing looks at all of the genes uh, that we have. But uh, you know, there are other types of genetic testing that look at more focused areas of, of our genetic information. And so typically what we do in a clinical setting is you know, see a patient who's got a specific condition that they're worried about or symptoms that might be consistent with a, a particular condition or group of conditions. And then we order a targeted genetic test that looks at the genes that are specifically associated with that condition or the, that group of conditions. And, we found in our study that, you know, if we had done that approach, if we had done the focused approach, we would not have missed anything. We didn't learn anything extra by doing the exome sequencing. Um, all the patients in our study who had a positive result would have been identified on one of these focused genetic tests. And so we called into question the benefit of doing a more general genetic test because it didn't seem to necessarily add anything from, from the perspective of addressing what's causing the Alzheimer's or dementia in that family. We had 50 different participants and all of them had either uh, early onset themselves, a strong family history, or both of those things. And out of those 50, only three people had, you know, one of these really harmful changes in a gene that causes it. So it's still a really small proportion of people who have those really remarkable histories of early onset and strong family history. Um, and so for that reason, you know, we tend to be pretty selective about who we're, who we're offering clinical genetic testing to. I think the important thing to acknowledge is that everybody has a risk of, of getting Alzheimer's or dementia. And this is an age dependent risk. So what that means is the longer you live, the higher your risk for that condition is. And from population studies, we know that, you know, in general, men who live to, you know, age 80 or so have somewhere in the neighborhood of a 10 to 15% chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. That's based on just the fact that they are men living to age 80. Women's risk uh, 
also living to age 80 is closer to 20%. So there is a, a higher risk for women. And uh, it's unclear exactly what, what the cause of the difference in risk is. But like I said, those risks are just based on sex and age. We know that if you start adding in other information that those risks can be increased or decreased. So having a family history where you've got one or more close relatives like a parent or a brother or a sister who's had Alzheimer's disease is going to increase that risk a little bit. And so, you know, the tricky thing is all of these different risk factors that we can look at and factor in can move that risk either up or down, but it doesn't tell you at the end of the day whether or not you are or are not going to get the condition. It just gives you a better idea of what the chances that you'll get it. And so I think that that can be really difficult information to internalize if, if you're thinking about what the impact is, not necessarily for yourself, but for other people in the family. So as a parent who, you know, has no cognitive symptoms right now, but has a family history of Alzheimer's disease, thinking about their children, it's really difficult to you know, think about what their risks might be based on all of that information. Commercial genetic testing has emerged to, to fill a need, right? There are people who want to know their genetic status for a number of different conditions. Maybe they've got a family history of a condition. Maybe they just you know, want to know because they feel like knowledge is power and they wanna be empowered by their own genetic information to then make decisions about how they're living their lives and managing their own health and wellness. And so I think that you know, a lot of people are, are turning to these commercial testing options, looking for something specific. And so what I would encourage anyone who's thinking about this to do is, really do your homework into what these tests are able to tell you. So find out what information you're going to get back and make sure that you uh, are getting the information that you're really looking for. And then I think the other tricky thing is, you know, being able to then incorporate that information into your plan. So, you know, right now, uh, for example, the genetic testing for APOE will return risk information. So it's not gonna be a black and white answer. Yes, you will get Alzheimer's or no, you won't it's going to give you some degree of risk. And we know that that risk prediction is on a population level, pretty well studied and pretty well established. But on an individual level, it's much harder to interpret what that information will mean for one person. And so I think that's the tricky thing is for people who are looking for certainty, you know, they may not necessarily find exactly what they're looking for if they turn to a commercial test, but they might get useful information that does empower them to make you know, informed choices about various things. And if that's what they're looking for, then, you know, it's absolutely within their rights to pursue that. But, you know, certainly it's, it's a really nuanced area, uh, you know, when we start getting into degrees of risk. And I think that everyone needs to think not only what do you want to know, but also how are you going to feel when you get that result back? Because once you know, there's no way to go back and unlearn something like that, you know, a genetic test result that tells you that you've got a higher risk for a condition. the overwhelming majority of them said that their primary reason for doing this was for the benefit to their family members. They wanted to know whether or not the dementia in their family was due to one of these single genetic changes that can be passed from parent to child, generation to generation, because they were concerned about other people in their family and they just wanted to try and do as much as they could to offer either reassurance or provide the opportunity to learn about your risk. A lot of other participants also said that they wanted to give back to research. I mean, we still don't know so much about these, these conditions, right? Dementing illnesses are in a lot of ways still a mystery. And patients who are currently going through evaluation and treatment for these conditions are often told that, you know, we, we don't have a lot of concrete data to go on. Um, and so that's where research is really trying to fill in those gaps. And so our participants were great because they they have seen those gaps themselves as they've gone through their own journey with these conditions and they're wanting to give back to that research community to help fill in those gaps so that you know the next wave of people who go through this hopefully have a, a different experience, a better experience than, than what they're having. We really are so grateful to the Ellison Foundation that provided the funding to do this study. I think without them, our participants would have been like many other patients clinically who 
are interested in this information but just can't afford to pay for it because right now insurance doesn't cover this type of testing. And the reason for that is there's usually no next step in terms of treatment or management that, that stems directly from a genetic test result. And so insurance companies consider it to be investigational and not a covered benefit. So we are so grateful that we had the funding to do this testing without having to charge our participants Therapeutics. I, I would love to see therapeutics. It's so incredibly frustrating, you know, as a provider to sit across the table from someone and, and give them information about a disease or a risk uh, that we can't do anything about. And, you know, I, I recognize that it feels frustrating to me as a provider, but it feels even more frustrating, I'm sure, for all of our patients. And, you know, as soon as we can start making a, a you know, positive difference on that front, I think we'll really start to see the benefit to individuals and families.